All right, guys, it's well past that time of year again. Sorry it came so late, but here's my top 10 films of 2013. For those of you new to my channel, here's a quick rundown of how these things usually go. So far, every year has had more than 10 films that I want to put on my list. So instead of having a redundant honorable mentions category, I just make my list to be longer than 10. If somehow there were only two movies in the entire year that were worth mentioning, then my list would be two movies long. Now, even though this video took me months longer than I thought it would, these lists usually come pretty late compared to other reviewers. Reason being is the earlier you make your list, the more films you're excluding from being on your list. Sometimes a great movie doesn't even have a Blu-ray release until 14 months after the year is over, so it makes sense to wait a bit if you don't want to exclude films for simply being foreign or independent. As for me, I watch way too many movies. The vast majority of them are complete shit, but if I can introduce you to at least one movie you love, then it's worth it and I've done my job. If you see something that looks interesting to you, please check it out and let me know if you liked it in the comments section. Now before getting to the actual list, I thought I'd give some quick mentions to my guilty pleasures of the year. These are films that I enjoyed very much on a personal level, but at the same time, I can understand that they're not necessarily great films. So in no particular order, let's start off the guilty pleasures with Grand Piano. The film stars Elijah Wood and is written by the writer-director of Whiplash, Damien Chazelle. This movie is kind of dumb and flawed, but it's a lot of fun and I love watching it. Despite its cheese, the camera work was actually pretty well done at times. As someone that plays piano, I could tell that Elijah Wood's performance was cheated, but but it was still cheated pretty well. Still, some aspects of the plot and presentation were a little questionable. It's incredibly cheesy, and just to move things along, I'll let this clip from the trailer speak for itself. Another guilty pleasure of mine from 2013 was Escape from Tomorrow, a weird and creepy film noir filmed in Disneyland without their permission. Apparently Disney is well aware of the Streisand effect and has decided not to make a big fuss about it. The movie has kind of a twisted sense of humor that I found myself enjoying quite a bit. I'm also quite fond of the contrast in having the color sucked out of the happiest place on earth. Now this is far from a masterful film and parts of it are pretty stupid, but the movie doesn't take itself too seriously in the first place. I mean, quite honestly, it's more of a comedy than anything and I kind of love that it exists. If for whatever reason you're not interested in checking out this film, then please do yourself a favor and at least check out the soundtrack, because it is shockingly great, especially for this kind of film. It's definitely not for everybody, but if this looks like fun for you, then check it out. Another 2013 guilty pleasure for me is Spring Breakers. Now this movie is pretty fucking polarizing. Many people walked into this movie thinking it was the very dumb garbage that it was actually satirizing. Others that knew more about the director of this film wound up praising it as a genius piece of art. As for me, I'm somewhere down the middle. I can see everything that it was going for, but I still don't think it was exactly genius. Still, I'm recommending it because to me, this is a very fun movie to watch while you're drunk. James Franco is not only great at playing his character, but he is hilariously entertaining, and hearing him whisper the words spring break over top of the film as it goes on is one of the funniest things to me. I watched this movie as a comedy, and I think it's a pretty funny one at that, so if you think you can handle it, then check it out. You girls is different from the rest. I knew y'all special from the moment I saw you. It's in your eyes. It's 
written on your faces. I want to make you happy. I want us all to fall in love. Let's cause some trouble now. Live life to the fullest. Spring break. Spring break forever. <laughs> Another guilty pleasure from 2013 is The Dirties. It's my understanding that some of you will probably think that this belongs on my actual list and not my guilty pleasures list, but because of the budget, this movie does have some presentation issues. There were a few moments in the film where all I could think was, oh, this is because of the ridiculously small budget. Still, with a budget of just $30,000, this film is kind of a fucking miracle in that sense. This film serves as not only a great comedy, but also a love letter to cinema, with the entire thing being absolutely filled with references to classic movies. And if you're a film lover like me, that brings an extra level of enjoyment. Their DVD slash Blu-ray covers are also parodies of popular film covers. If you're a collector like me, I would get one of these as soon as possible because they are selling out. I would have loved to have had the Memento cover, but alas, I was too late. Still, these ones are pretty fucking cool. If this looks like your cup of tea, then check it out. It's the hard thing about writing songs, even any little- Oh, and what about this? For the shooting? <laughs> I guess it's not safe because this, what are we, we're promoting a choking hazard. What did they say as a kid? You'll die? Bags used to say that. Put this over a child's head and the child will die. You say he'll suffocate. We'll suffocate. Well, what the hell is this? I'm fine. What about this shirt? Is this shirt too much? <laughs> is this perfect? P crazy killers always obsessed with catching the rye. I like how you're wearing that hunting hat the way you like it. No, wrong. That's better. The point is, isn't this wicked? Yes. School shooting. <laughs> it's the catcher in the rye theme school shoes. It's like we're planning a prom. And the last movie on my list of 2013 guilty pleasures is Everything is Terrible Does the Hip Hop. Everything is Terrible is a website that takes old bad VHS footage and turns it into consumable entertainment. Many people watch them for their short videos, but I personally love their movies the most. To Everything to Terrible Tokyo Drift is my favorite. Now with Everything is Terrible Does the Hip Hop, this one's approach is a little different than the other ones I've seen. Basically, they took a bunch of hip hop segments and threw them together, but they put in the effort to have it sync up so that it plays as one continuous song. And boy, is it ever fun. Now, for the sake of disclosure, I will mention that I'm Facebook friends with a few of these guys and two of them did crash at my house one time. But also keep in mind that I've mentioned them on this channel before any of that, so this recommendation is genuine. It's super fun, it's nostalgic, and it's great to have on with a bunch of drunk people. So go check it out. <laughs> Cause if you do, you're sure to fall. Don't make your life but total mess. It's just without the same be the best. Look out. What y'all doing to your body? Popcorn, potato chip, candy, soda pop. This ain't good. You gotta keep your bodies in shape. I'm gonna have to get you in shape my way. Come on, let's go. Take a genius to be able to see. All right, now that that's out of the way, let's get to my actual list. Try your best to keep in mind that just because a movie might be listed as 2012 on IMDb doesn't necessarily make it a 2012 movie. There's a lot of different variables that come into play like film festivals and different geographic release dates. So just trust that these are at least 2013 movies for me, even if you might think that one of them should be in a different year. Starting off this list at number 19 is The Congress. Anyone who was a fan of the film Waltz with Bashir from my 2008 list might want to check this out because it is the same direction. Director. Now I think Waltz with Bashir is a lot better and these are very different movies, but the Congress is great in its own way. The film is set in a not too distant dystopian future where Robin Wright plays herself. I don't want to give away too much about the plot, but let's just say it's one of the most unique and creative films that I've seen in a very long time. I also quite enjoyed the movie's commentary on the film industry, with one of the prominent characters being a studio executive from Miramount, an intentional play on words that mixes the name Miramax with Paramount. Now this film 
film does have a few presentation issues, hence being so low on this list. There were a couple scenes that were more difficult to take seriously than others. One person's age makeup was a little off, and some of it just didn't make all that much sense. But trust me when I say that this movie more than makes up for it. Love it or hate it, but this film has cult classic written all over it. Now this is one of those movies where the less you know about it beforehand, the better. So don't look up trailers, don't look up posters, don't look up anything, just watch it. Robin. Your career is almost over. Uh, you fell off the top a, a long time ago. And the economy of scanned actors, uh, they're not worth two bucks. We're at war, Robin. Any actor who hasn't signed in the next six months is dead, gone. Characters erased from the screen forever. You'll be back on all fours begging me to sample you. And, and what is it that I have to do to make this happen? Nothing. Just sign. Half a day of scanning. That's it? That's it. That and you must agree never to act again. Anywhere. For all eternity. At number 18 is Blackfish, a documentary about killer whales and SeaWorld's unethical business practices. This is quite the captivating documentary, and just like The Cove, it functions as a great documentary on its own without resorting to being one of those sappy PETA films. Putting all emotion and politics aside, this is still a very well-made documentary. It's well-paced and well-edited, and I was kind of blown away by how much accompanying footage they had. To have so much footage of these events as they happened rather than just people's eyewitness accounts not only brings legitimacy to what they're saying, but also makes the film a lot more disturbing. This film has generated so much controversy that SeaWorld's stock has plummeted since its release. Anyway, I thought this documentary was pretty well made overall, so go check it out. Because the whales in their pools die young, they like to say that all orcas die at 25 or 30 years. 25 to 35 years. 25 to 35 years. They're documented uh, in the wild, living to be about 35 mid-30s. They tend to live a lot longer in this environment because they have all the veterinary care. And of course that's false. Uh, we knew by 1980, after a half a dozen years of the research, that they live equivalent to human lifespans. And every other potentially embarrassing fact is twisted and turned and denied one way or another. So in the, in the wild they live less. less. And then when... Like the floppy dorsal fins. 25% of whales have a fin that, that turns over like that as they get older. Dorsal collapse happens in less than 1% of, of wild killer whales. We know this. All of the captive males, 100% have collapsed dorsal fins. And number 17 on this list is a French film called Young and Beautiful. The story is about a 17-year-old girl who decides to start working as a call girl after losing her virginity. Based on that plot, you should expect that the film is somewhat sexual. And even though this film is somewhat adult, it never really feels gratuitous and pornographic. I mean, it's probably not the kind of movie you're gonna wanna watch with your parents, but keep in mind that this movie is much more about the story and characters than it is about the sex. Not only is it well shot and very well acted, but the the score for the film is also pretty fucking great. If this seems interesting to you, then check it out. Jam to death? Pas vraiment. Tu étais avec tes parents? Oui. Enfin, c'était mon beau-père. Ta mère aussi est une très belle femme. Elle ne se doute de rien. Non. Vaut mieux pas. Tu m'as menti pour ton âge, non? Rien 
At number 16 is Before Midnight by Richard Linklater. Now this film is actually the third in a trilogy, the first being Before Sunrise in 1995 and the second being Before Sunset in 2004. Now personally, I'd consider it to be very important to watch the other films first. You could still watch, enjoy, and understand this movie on its own, but watching the other films first adds a lot more to the experience. And it is quite something to see these characters we love grow over time. It should come as no surprise that this is the same director as Boyhood. In my opinion, these films are a lot better than Boyhood. The Before trilogy is mostly dialogue, but it never really feels boring or stale. And a lot of that is in part due to these characters' as chemistry. Both the actors and characters are able to work off of each other very naturally. It's almost hard to believe that watching two people talk could be so entertaining until you actually see the movies. Now they're all great, but out of all three of them, this is probably the worst. This one in particular starts off a little slower than the other ones, but it does build up as it goes along. Like I said though, all three of them are great, and I hope we see another one in 2022. So check out the first movie, and if you fall in love with these characters like I did, then you might even want to watch the director's film called Waking Life in between the first and second movie, which includes a four minute scene featuring these exact same characters. Waking Life is also a great movie that I would recommend, but it's not an absolute necessity when watching this trilogy because honestly most of the movie has nothing to do with them. Anyway, if this looks good to you, then check it out. Last night, mm -hmm. I had this dream where I was reading a book. Okay, it was a lost classic, The Rovers. The Rovers? Yeah, like roving around, you know, wandering. It was all these young people. Okay, is that a real book? No, 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 no but it was really great. It was okay. fresh, funny, experimental. It had all this energy. I love that you read books in your dreams. It's... I know, and they're, they're always really good. I have like major action hero dreams. Like I'm flying around like a superhero, breaking through walls. And at the end, I have an orgasm. <laughs> I'm gonna try to make your dreams come true, baby. At number 15 on my list is Francis Ha. I shit you not, the last two people I mentioned this movie to said, is that a movie about a Chinese guy? Francis Ha is a film from acclaimed director Noah Baumbach. He directed The Squid and the Whale, and he also co-wrote Fantastic Mr. Fox with Wes Anderson. Francis Ha makes for a really entertaining character study, but it's also heartfelt and it's really funny. Unlike a lot of other films that have decided to present themselves in black and white, this film actually feels very retro, which is saying a lot when so many other modern black and white films feel way too modern in their approach. Anyway, don't just take my word for it. Quentin Tarantino included this film in his top 10 of 2013 as well. Just check it out. Do you want to move in with me? Yeah. Yeah? Yes. I mean, I mean, I do have this other thing. What other thing? Well, I don't know. I promised Sophie I'd stay through the lease and she'll probably want to renew it. Is that bad? I'm sorry. I feel bad. Can't you find someone else? Yeah, but it's my friend. Uh huh. I want to move in with you. Okay. I feel bad. Don't feel bad. Forget it. No. What? Nothing. You're mad. I'm not mad. I'm disappointed. I feel bad. Stop feeling bad. Francis, I asked you to move in with me. You said no. But I can't. You can. You don't want to. Who is it? It's okay, I don't have to get it. Who is it? It's Sophie, I'll just call her back later. Just pick up the phone. Are you sure? Answer it. Yo, girl, what's up? <laughs> At number 14 on this list is Martin Scorsese's The Wolf of Wall Street. Now I've come to understand that some people don't like this movie because it's a little too similar to Goodfellas, and while they do kind of hit the same beats, I would say that they're pretty dramatically different in tone, because The Wolf of Wall Street makes for one hilarious comedy. Leo DiCaprio was great as always, Jonah Hill was surprisingly great, everything in this film is just so fun, fast-paced, and action-packed that you barely even notice the three-hour runtime. I've also heard some complaints about the morality of this this movie, so keep in mind that the film does not endorse any of the actions by any of the characters. Whether you walk out of the movie thinking that the main character was an awesome guy or a piece of shit, that's completely up for you to interpret. Either way, this movie was incredibly entertaining for me, so I'd suggest you check it out. Get the fuck out of here. Smoke crack with me, bro. Fuck, smoke crack. Smoke some fucking crack with me, bro. One hit. One hit. That's it.
啊！but its presentation has some cool choices in it too. One of them you should notice by watching this clip. If you like what you see, then I'd suggest checking it out. Number 12, we have No, a movie set in 1988 Chile, focusing on an ad executive responsible for the No campaign against Augusto Pinochet. The entire film was shot on the same kind of cameras that were commonly used for television in 1980s Chile, and it gives the film a very interesting and fun to watch style. And more importantly, you've still got a great movie even if you take that out of the equation. Gael Garcia Bernal is fantastic as usual, and the film makes a lot of great statements on advertising, public perception, politics, and propaganda. There's a lot of political movies out there, but this one offers a fresh perspective, so I'd recommend checking this one out. Una cuenta importante, ¿Cuál? Televisión Nacional. Anda a con la ropa chica. ¿A dónde está la otra? Está acá. Este... Está muy bien, ¿eh? Está perfecto. Está bueno. ¿Está funcionando? Sí. ¿Ah, sí? Está el pollo. ¿Sabes qué? Cuidado, leí que cuando te acercas demasiado, <risa> causa radiación. Es más de lejos. Sí, está lejos. No, no se lo digas ahí. Creo que, creo que no, no está muy seguro. Vale. ¿Está bien con la pala blanca, sí? Sí. Bueno. At number 11 is The Dance of Reality by Alejandro Jodorowsky. Now I love this film, but it is probably the least accessible out of everything on this list. If you find yourself intimidated by films that don't stick to a standard narrative, then this might not be the one to start with. Even regardless, I would actually recommend watching The Holy Mountain before this one. The Holy Mountain is currently my favorite movie, and it would be a good place to start to get used to his style. What I love about Jodorowsky is that everything about his art seems so open and transparent. His films are very spiritual, and although Though I'm not a very spiritual person, it's clear to me that everything he puts into his art has a personal sense of purpose for him. Now, although his films are far from literal, it's usually not too difficult to see the ideas he's getting at in each scene. Keep in mind that although it's obviously personal, it's not supposed to be taken extremely seriously. A lot of what he winds up showing is intentionally absurdist, and to me that adds to the entertainment. There are only really a couple issues that I have with this movie. One of the performances in one of the scenes wasn't as good as it could have been, and there were a couple moments where the point he was trying to make was a little too obvious, but regardless, I still think that this movie's great. It's definitely no holy mountain, but it is worth checking out.
Dios no existe. Te mueres y te pudres. Después no hay nada. At number 10 is The World's End by Edgar Wright. This is technically the third film in a trilogy, but since each of the films have completely different stories and characters, they are standalone movies. Now I've seen everything he's made since his TV series Space, and I've gotta say that everything I've seen has been absolute gold. If I could make my 2010 list all over again, Scott Pilgrim would be on it. As I've mentioned on this channel before, I was pretty disappointed for him not to be directing Ant-Man, because his skills as a director separate him from nearly everybody else working in comedy right Right now. If you still need some convincing, then I strongly encourage you to watch this video by Tony Joe from Every Frame of Painting. If you have not checked out this guy's channel yet, let me just say that it's better than mine. Anyway, The World's End is probably the worst out of the trilogy, but just like before Midnight, it is still worthy of this list. I do like how for this film they decided to change up the dynamic between the characters of Simon Pegg and Nick Frost. The humor, both spoken and visual, is on point as usual, but I guess my only complaint for this film when comparing it to the two others in the trilogy is that the main antagonist in this film didn't feel all that threatening. Every other element from Shaun of the Dead and Hot Fuzz is still there, but having a threatening antagonist that makes you feel a sense of urgency and consequence is something that Shaun of the Dead and Hot Fuzz both did better than this film. Like I said though, still great, still entertaining, and still hilarious. So tell me more. Uh, what? Crowning Glory, is it nutty? Is it foamy? Is it hoppy? Does it have a surprisingly fruity note which lingers on the tongue? Mmm, spear. Mmm. We'll have five of those, please. No, sorry. Can we have four of those and a tap water, please? What? <laughs> well, I don't believe this. A man of your legendary prowess drinking fucking rain. It's like seeing a, a lion eating some hummus. Doesn't make any sense. No, it doesn't make any sense. You seriously have a problem with me not drinking after what happened? I don't. King Arthur does. Oh, this will be good. What's King Arthur got to do with it? Do you honestly think that King Arthur came back from the Battle of Hastings, fucking rocked up at Arthur's castle, Camelot, walked up to the bar and went, hello, can I have a tap water? No, because they didn't have running water in Arthurian times. Exactly. He would have had a mead the king author of beers. At number nine on this list is Prisoners by French-Canadian director Denis Villeneuve. This is the same guy that directed Incendie that placed fairly high on my 2010 list, and he's currently in pre-production to be directing a Blade Runner sequel. Based on films like these ones, I'd say there's hope that it's in good hands. Prisoners is a gripping thriller that goes by the books but better. The vast majority of it is shot so well that it almost has kind of a David Fincher vibe to it. Now, some people consider this movie to be on the same level as any other random Hollywood thriller, which is a little sad because this film does so much more than that. The cinematography is incredibly impressive, the children in this movie actually act like children, and to top it off, there are some fantastic performances in this movie, with Hugh Jackman's acting abilities being used to their full potential. Now obviously the movie isn't perfect, there is one performance in this movie that wasn't all that great, and it does feel slightly cliched at points, but with everything this movie accomplished successfully, it's hard not to give it proper credit. If what you're looking for is a well-made thriller that's accessible to most everyone, then I would recommend checking this one out. Did, did you give him a lie detector? You gave us a lie detector. Did you give him one? Sir, I understand what you're asking me. Yes, we did. We yeah. gave him a lie detector and there's no way of... <sighs> a lie detector doesn't work if you don't understand the questions. Well, maybe he wasn't on his own. How could he drive an RV if he has an IQ of a 10-year-old? Hey, we're considering all possibilities. I don't think you are considering no, all I, possibilities. I hear, I hear what you're saying. No, sir, you listen sir, to me. Just I... shut the fuck up for a fucking second. This is what I'm going to need you to do for me. I need you to calm down. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Please listen to me for a second. Mr. Dover, I understand this is an incredibly hard time, but I have every uniformed police officer in this state looking for Anna. I don't understand what any of this means. They said he ran. They said he tried to get away. I don't understand why he would try to run away. We're considering all possibilities, Mr. Dover. 
Number eight on this list is Blue Jasmine from Woody Allen. Kate Blanchett won Best Female Performance for this movie, and I've gotta say, it was well deserved. If you like drama slash comedies with strong, interesting, and well performed characters, then this movie's for you. Kate Blanchett plays an affluent woman who finds herself needing to move back in with her not so affluent sister. Watching both of these actors perform is the highlight of the movie because they both do an outstanding job. Seriously, there are so many subtleties in Kate Blanchett's performance that none of the other nominations came even close for me. The story is clever and well written, appropriately jumping back and forth between past and present, with each new piece of information bringing more context to the characters and their struggles. This is a fantastic film and I'd recommend it to everybody. So what are you gonna study in college, Jasmine? Let me guess. A nurse. Huh? Is that how I impress you? The, a nurse? You, you got something against nurses? My sister's a nurse. You know, nurses are very hot to go to bed with. <laughs> yeah, because they have extensive knowledge of how the human body works. So. Be careful of what you accuse my sister of. No, I'm just saying, I know quite a few good nurses. Joey, why didn't you change the subject? Yeah, you think you're being charming, but you're not. You always stare into space like that? I had a friend who used to do that all the time, but there was something wrong with him. He was epileptic. I'm not epileptic. If you see the waitress, I'd like another stolen martini with a twist of lemon. So what are you going to study, Jasmine? Oh, Jesus, leave her alone. It's like the third time you asked her. For well, what? She hasn't answered me. I don't know, but I'll be sure to keep you informed. Okay, sorry. At number seven is The Past from the director of A Separation. Now, even though I found A Separation to be a little overrated, I still enjoyed it a lot. But if there's one thing that's for certain about this director, boy, does he ever know how to end a movie. This is another movie where I don't want to reveal too much about the plot because the way that the plot is revealed is pretty fucking important to the story. Every single one of the performances was absolutely fantastic with Berenice Bejo from The Artist taking away best female performance from Cannes Film Festival. Anyway, grab some tissues and watch this movie for yourself because I think it's pretty fantastic. You know, this type, I don't think it's so antipathetic. At this moment, he must be completely perturbed. But he has his place between the story of his wife and the suicide he must do for his son. How will he do to marry another woman? You told me that his wife is in the common. She's not dead. She's not dead. She's not dead. C'est son problème, ça regarde que lui. Tu sais pourquoi sa femme est en commun Non. Comment je saurais Ma mère t'a rien dit Non. C'est suicidé. À cause de sa dépression Lucie, qu'est-ce qu'il y a Lucie. And number six on my list is a documentary called The Act of Killing. This is one of the most unique, disturbing, and resonating documentaries ever made. The film follows around gangsters that were hired by the Indonesian government in the 1960s to kill anyone who opposed the military dictatorship. Over the course of the film, they proudly brag about their accomplishments. Suffice it to say, this movie's kind of fucked up. This film is like one giant statement on how human beings can normalize pretty much anything, regardless of how absolutely atrocious and horrifying it is. Now, one of the ways I try to judge documentaries as films is to ask myself this. If this exact same movie were fictional, would it still be a great movie? And the answer for this film is a resounding yes. A different filmmaker might have approached this subject by essentially giving us a factual lecture on the events, but Joshua Oppenheimer's approach managed to turn this into a powerful piece of art, wherein the subjects of the film are character studies themselves. The Blu-ray has both a theatrical cut and a director's cut, theatrical being two hours and the director's cut cut being 2 hours and 40 minutes. After having seen both of them, I would recommend the director's cut, because a decent amount of the footage that was missing from the theatrical release was pretty great. However, if you're more comfortable with watching a 2 hour movie, the theatrical cut is still great. So decide for yourself, because the movie isn't ruined either way. Anyway, I can't recommend this movie enough. I would also highly recommend checking out The Look of Silence, which might be in theaters for some of you right now. It's a documentary from the same director on the same subject, but with a completely different approach. I've only seen it once 
sense, but right now it's difficult to say which one I like more. But personally, I found it to be the best film of 2015 so far. Anyway, check out The Act of Killing and prepare to be amazed and disturbed at the same time. <laughs> Kalau dulu kita main pukul, pertama itu datang kita main pukul, itu kan darah banyak. Di sini kan, di sini kan darah, di sini kan darah banyak ini kan. <tuh> Jadi karena telur banyak, darah itu kan bersihnya kan bau, ya kan. Jadi cara cara untuk jangan keluar darah itu, inilah pakai sistem ini. Ya, saya peragakan boleh kan? Boleh. Boleh ya. At number five on my list is Simon Killer, the second film from director Antonio Campos. A while back, I watched his first film, After School, and although I thought it was all right, the presentation felt a little too borrowed. At no point did I feel as though he was untalented, but the whole film just felt as though it was trying really hard to be Benny's video. Fast forward to Simon Killer, and I've gotta say I'm really fucking impressed. The first time I watched this movie, I thought it was pretty decent. The second time I watched it, I thought that it was pretty great. And on my third watch, I absolutely loved it. Now don't get yourself fooled by the title into thinking that this is some sort of movie about a serial killer. Instead, this film functions as a meticulous character study of a complete sociopath, and Brady Corbett brings this character to life pretty fucking flawlessly. I've seen him in a lot of supporting roles over the years, and he's always done a great job, so it's great to finally see him in a lead role because he did a fantastic job. As for the directing, there are still some Hanukkah-esque elements there, but this time it's got enough of Antonio's own voice in there that it doesn't really feel like a copycat. Just try to imagine that Mikhail Hanukkah and Nicholas Winding Refn had a baby, and this is the second film they've ever made. This movie might not be a 10 out of 10 film for me, but it shows a lot of potential and a lot of promise for this director, and I can't wait to see what he does in the future with a higher budget. I should also mention that the song choices for this film were all fantastic. The film got released on Region B Blu-ray under the Eureka Masters of Cinema series, so if you live in Region B or have a region-free Blu-ray player, I'd suggest picking this one up. Region locking is incredibly stupid, but at least this company seems to agree. If you put the disc in a Region A player, it makes a pretty decent point. Anyway, if you're looking to get into the mind of a character that will both intrigue and disturb you, then I'd recommend checking this one out. Oh, okay. I mean, imagine this. Your phone. I mean, your phone, it doesn't have a camera, but if it did, you take this and you put it right here. Here, go sit over there. And whatever happened in that room, you would have it. And then what? And then... Huh? And then... I mean, instead of taking a little money from a lot of men, you could take a lot of money from one. Number four on my list is Upstream Color by Shane Carruth. This is his second film ever, with his first being Primer back in 2004. Both of these films are ones that Shane wrote, directed, produced, starred in, and even composed the music for, holy shit! And wow is he ever able to work within a budget. Primer had a budget of just $7,000, and even this one was dirt cheap at $50,000. Like Primer, Upstream Color doesn't really hold your hand as you watch it. The first time you watch this movie, you're likely going to feel a little confused as it goes on. On. But trust me that this film is not one giant artistic metaphor like the dance of reality. The film is showing you an actual story, and everything that's happening is pretty literal. I might make an explanation video at some point, and that shouldn't be too difficult to do, but don't hold me to it because there's a lot of stuff that I'm trying to catch up on first. With Upstream Color, Shane Carruth has dramatically improved in terms of cinematography, with some sequences in the film almost feeling as though they would belong in the tree of life. This film is original, inventive, and pretty fucking clever, and I can't wait to see what he comes up 
up with next, even if we have to wait another nine years. If you want to watch a well-delivered drama that makes you think, then check this one out. At number three is Inside Lewin Davis by the Coen Brothers. It goes to show that at this point in their career, they've got filmmaking down to a science. Everything from the time period to the quirks and mannerisms of the characters just feels so real. And the folk music that plays a big part in this movie is done exceptionally well. Now there's obviously a lot more to this movie than just the music, but if you really hate folk music, then I'd suggest not watching it. As a person who listens to all genres, I'd say the music accompanied the film very well. Oscar Isaac did a fantastic job playing this character, and his struggles become more and more relatable as the film goes on. This is one of the very best films of the year, and I'd suggest checking it out. It's not a big re-education for the public. Mel? Mel! How you doing, kid? Mel, there was no advance on my solo record. There's got to be some royalty. Fucking Christ's sake, it's cold out. I don't even have a winter coat. Jesus Christ, you're kidding me. Take this kid. No, no. I insist. I insist. I don't want your fucking coat. What'll you wear? Kid, I'll get by. It won't even fit me. This is... It's bullshit, Mel. It's just a big fat fucking bluff. Bluff? Kid, what are you... So... Bluff? I offer you this... Get the fuck out of my office. All right, thanks for the coat. What? All right, well, wait. Ah, shit. Let me give you 40 bucks. Number two on my list is 12 Years a Slave by Steve McQueen. Now, it's kind of sad that there's so many people out there that think that this was only critically acclaimed because it's supposedly race baiting. And that's sad to me because that means either one of two things. Either they haven't watched it, or they have absolutely no grasp at all for what makes good filmmaking. You'd have to be absolutely clueless about performances, cinematography, music, and so on. Because this film is absolutely outstanding on all fronts. This is Steve McQueen's third feature-length film, and so far, all three of them have been on my yearly lists. He's right now my second favorite director, and who knows, he might even become my first, because he is one of the absolute most talented people working in the film industry today. In 12 Years a Slave, he was able to get the very most out of every single actor he worked with. There's an incredible amount of attention to detail in not only the performances, but how the characters are written. Characters that had more educated backgrounds had a different kind of dialect than those that didn't. Hans Zimmer's score was phenomenal, as he was able to bring in a modern intensity while sticking to traditional instruments. Instruments. Overall, the presentation of this film was pretty fucking genius, with Steve McQueen having an expert grasp on how to tell this story. What's shown, what's not shown, and how things are revealed are all very important, and Steve McQueen understands this better than most everyone. There are scenes in the film where a shot will continue to linger on a subject, and as it does that, you're forced to absorb so much more about the situation. And suddenly you're not so much watching a movie anymore, and you're left to become but a witness of the gruesome brutality being displayed on the screen. This is one of the most powerful films I've ever seen, and it's the best story of human survival I've seen in a very long time. And if you're not gonna see this movie because you think that it's supposed to somehow make you feel guilty for an event that you weren't even alive to experience, then I hope that someday you manage to overcome that feeling, because otherwise you'll be missing out on one of the absolute best films of the year.
And my number one film of 2013 is, yeah, you guessed it, it's her. Director Spike Jones has done some amazing work in the past with other writers in charge of the story, so with him being the sole writer and director of this film, I was pleasantly surprised to see something this great. It seems as though all that time he spent with Charlie Kaufman really rubbed off on him because this feels like the Charlie Kaufman movie that he never wrote. Both the writing and the presentation flow together so perfectly in this movie that I'm glad he has the directing skills to be able to bring his vision to life. I love that this movie never tries to endlessly lecture you on the rules of its universe, and while that can work for some futuristic movies, this one commits itself to being more about the characters. The futuristic setting is merely a vehicle for the character's story, so having an opening title explaining what year it is and every detail about the political climate and so on would just be so unnecessary. However, the most important thing to consider about the rules of the universe for any movie is that those rules don't contradict themselves. Without a consistent universe, it's not a believable universe. Spike Jones was able to add more legitimacy to his universe through his presentation. Rather than having characters explain things like the smog in the atmosphere, the prevalence of technology in their lives, the current state of video games, and so on, the movie showed these things in a way that we were able to pick up on these things by ourselves. And because of that, it implies to our brains that there's a universe in the film that's bigger than what we're seeing on screen, and thus it adds to the believability, where something futuristic and surreal can still feel real. Not only that, but the film pays close attention to how human beings operate psychologically. Even today, we see technology playing more and more of a role in our lives, both romantically and sexually. In one quick scene near the beginning of the film, we can see exactly how far this has gone, with our main character effortlessly connecting to a network of people seeking out fantasy roleplay. And once again, this isn't something that's explained or lectured to us, it's something that we're able to observe and figure out for ourselves. Joaquin Phoenix, as usual, does a phenomenal job playing his character. The soundtrack by Arcade Fire was perfect, and choosing that kind of tone and style for this film was incredibly appropriate. Rather than having that cheesy, cliched electronic music to constantly remind the audience that they're in the future, Arcade Fire brought more of a current but almost retro feel to it, and in doing so, it helps our brains feel more connected to the events in the film. Mixing the familiar and the unfamiliar helps bridge the gap. Listening to one of the piano songs from this film, I can tell that they're using a real piano instead of synthesizing it, and when those faster right-hand movements come in, it's obvious that they're not using a metronome, and it's having those little imperfections that makes it all sound so genuine. To have a sterile and perfect sound for this film would be out of place, because the film's universe is neither sterile nor perfect. I think um, it was the idea we were trying to make this very warm, tactile world with, with the, the materials and the fabrics and the woods and, and cr create this, this, this world that felt like this utopic world that everything's nice and everything's comfortable, yet even in this world where you're seemingly getting everything you need and having this nice life, there's still loneliness and longing and isolation and disconnection. And if I had to define what I'm picturing, it would be utopic. And that sort of started this, tr this train of thought, which was you know, sort of where we ended up and making this world that's comfortable and nice and convenient and, you know, much like our world, but just a heightened version of our world where everything is getting nicer as the years go and there's more design and there's more convenience and our technology is making things easier, but uh, there's still this loneliness and Change. I love absolutely everything about this movie. Writing, acting, directing, production design, everything. And it's got Chris Pratt. Everybody likes him. If you haven't seen this movie, then see it as soon as possible because it is my favorite film of 2013. Samantha? What? Wouldn't you? Why not? I don't know. I'd have to see if there was some... I can't believe I'm having this conversation with my computer. You're not. <laughs> You're having this conversation with me. You want me to email her? Uh, We've got nothing to lose. Do it. Do it. Do it. Yeah. Yes. Email her. Okay, perfect. Yeah, let's, let's do it. Make, make a reservation someplace great. Yeah? Oh, I've got just the place. Who is that talking? Oh, that's my friend Samantha. Is she a girl? Yeah. I hate women. All they do is cry all the time. <laughs> that's not true. You know, men cry too. I actually like crying sometimes. It feels good. I didn't know you were a little pussy. Is that why you don't have a girlfriend? I'll go out that day girl and fuck her brains out and show you how it's done. You can watch him cry. Okay. This kid has some problems. You have some fucking problems, lady. Really? Okay, I'm gonna go. go get out um, of here, fatty. Oh, good luck. Come on. Follow me, pussy. <laughs> 
Well, there you have it, some 2013 shit. The next one of these you'll see from me will either be for 2007 or 2014, don't know yet. Anyway, I hope I've introduced you to some movies that you'll love. Feel free to report back in the comments section. Anyway, thanks for watching, I'm gonna go work on some other reviews now, bye! Hey guys, it's Adam here, coming at you with my top five reasons why I love abortion. Oh wait a second, I see some names coming up from the bottom of the screen and they're so, they're so dank that it just completely derailed my train of thought. Now all I can think of is how those names got there. They must have gotten there by going to patreon.com slash YMS because they're so dank. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video because it took me fucking forever to make and now my back is really sore from sitting in this chair so long. Anyway, I try my best to update people on when things are coming out on my Twitter. That's the best place to go if you if you are interested in finding out when things are supposed to be coming out. However, I am really, 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 really bad at anticipating when things are going to come out if it's far ahead in the future. Like, my last, my last tweet that I made, uh, I'm pretty sure it's going to be fairly accurate as to which, which day this will be published. But in terms of trying to figure out when things are going to come out, like, months in advance, it's really fucking difficult. Because... Every video takes a different amount of time to make. Some things are more time sensitive than others. If something's still in theaters, I want to tackle that first. I have to put something else on hold while I work on something else. It's uh, it's a big fucking mess, and now it's almost the end of the month. I thought that I would get uh, two Patreon-supported videos out this month. It might not happen. It looks like it probably won't happen, even though I'm like... Halfway through another video, this shit takes time. And because of that, I'm now making plans to get some extra help on this channel. Uh, Mark English, who has been editing videos for my gaming channel for the past, I guess, year now, he's been doing a great job. If you have not seen one of the videos from my gaming channel, start with this one right here. God damn it. Start with this one. Fucking, no, just start with the one in the, the bottom of the thing. Start start with that one. Yeah, that's, uh, that's a good one to start with. And uh, if, if uh, you like that, then you'll like the stuff that he'll be making for uh, this channel. Uh, we're in the middle of making plans for it. I will make another video about that and some other changes coming up. So stay tuned for a big, big like update, reevaluation, where the channel's going, etc. video. I'm going to be making one of those uh, in the next couple weeks. Anyway. Uh, I love you guys. Thank you very much for your support, whether it be on Patreon or sharing my videos or commenting or liking or anything. Feedback, etc. All the Reddit vote and like everywhere. Fucking crazy town. Anyway, now that this video is out of the way, my next big project is going to be a YMS review. There haven't been any for a while because of the Synecdoche, New York videos that I've been working on. They really, really took up a lot of time. I'm gonna have to figure out my schedule in a way that I can do everything consistently and make sense. Again, that'll be in addressed in the video coming up. But anyway, I love you guys. Thank you very much. Couldn't do this without you. I'm gonna peace off right now and get ready for my Sunday Twitch stream because it's Sunday morning right now. Not while you're watching this unless that's just a coincidence and it's another week that's not today. Peace out. Love you.